All right, by my clock, it is seven o'clock mountain time. And so I think that means it is time for us to get started. So I'm gonna kick us off with just a couple of introductions, some brief housekeeping items, and then I will pass the proverbial mic over to Paula so that she can get started with our presentation. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am so excited to be back for another exciting Wednesday evening with all of you, this time focused on spiders and arachnology. This evening, we're going to be hearing from our Curator of Arachnology, Curator of Invertebrate Zoology, Dr. Paula Cushing, all about spiders. Uh, we know that spiders are maybe something that some people love, something that some people hate, some some people might just have a healthy respect and say, you know what, spider, as long as you're over there in that corner of the room, that's okay. But tonight, we're here to tell you a little bit about spiders, their arachnid cousins, uh, and teach you a little bit about why these guys are actually great to have in your house, even if they freak you out a little bit. So hopefully, you're going to come away with some questions answered, uh, a new and healthy respect, maybe even some love for spiders and arachnids. So I'm going to, at this point, ask Paula to uh, start up her webcam, give you a big wave. Um, Paula is going to take over in just a moment. Uh, and please do, as we've already seen so many of you doing tonight, continue to use the chat for any questions or comments. Uh, we will be watching. We do have your chats going only to Paula and I, so nobody else is going to see those, but we are watching them. I think, Paula, you just chimed in in the chat saying that you're taking note of some of the questions that are coming in, even this early on in the program. Uh, I will do so as well. I will have my eye on the chat all night. So if you have any questions, uh, we'll try and get to as many as we can after the presentation is over. And if there's anything I can help you with, do pop that question in the chat. Oh, Paula, your background just got really intense. Uh, <laughs> a second ago, it was just catching her green curtains as a green screen. So Paula, there we go. We might need to forego the background. Oh, technology. So. <laughs> you are fickle. You are fickle. All right, folks, we're going to kick it off. If you haven't already done so, take a moment to type in the chat and say hi. Let us know where you're watching from tonight. Let, let us know how you feel about spiders and arachnids. Let us know where you're watching from. Maybe you're sitting out on the back porch. Maybe you're inside the house. Maybe you're watching dinner and having a nice drink. Uh, maybe you've got some young scientists, some aspiring arachnologists with you. We love to know all that stuff. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn off my microphone and my webcam and kick it over to Dr. Paula Cushing, Curator of Invertebrate Zoology. Paula, how you doing? I am doing great, Talia. Thank you so much for the great introduction. I appreciate it. And I'm going to just charge right in and share my screen if the technology works. And it looks like it's going to work just fine today. So welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see such a great audience and people and names that I recognize and new people and arachnophiles and arachnophobes. So as Talia said, I'm Paula Cushing. I'm curator of invertebrate zoology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And my specialty, my research specialty, it's arachnology. I've been uh, studying arachnids since I was knee high to a grasshopper, so for a very, very long time. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you an overview of spider biology and the good that they do in the world. So uh, what are spiders? Spiders are the lions and tigers of the world of creepy crawlies. They are eating lots and lots of insects every year, and they are found everywhere. In, uh, in every terrestrial environment on Earth except in Antarctica. A couple years ago, some colleagues published a paper where they estimated that the worldwide population of spiders is eating 400 to 800 million tons of insect prey. That's extraordinary. And they also, in the same paper, estimated that the human population of seven plus billion of us was only eating about 200 million tons of protein every year. So think about that. Spiders are eating more than twice the amount of protein in the form of insects than humans eat in the form of whatever protein sources we eat. So spiders are incredibly important predators of insects in every terrestrial environment on Earth. Now, now scientists being very orderly people, we like to organize life on Earth into different taxonomic categories. From biggest to smallest, these categories are kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So the animals that I'm going to be talking about tonight are in fact animals. They are in the kingdom Animalia. 
they are in a big group called the phylum arthropoda within that kingdom. And arthropods include anything with an outside exoskeleton and jointed legs. So that big phylum, arthropoda, includes not just spiders and other arachnids, but it also includes insects, millipedes, centipedes, crabs. Those are all arthropods in that phylum. Within that phylum, there are lots of different classes, and the class that I'm gonna be talking about today is the class Arachnida. Now within that class, there are about 12 different orders. Spiders are in one of those 12 orders. Spiders are in the order Arachnidae. And as of two days ago, there were in that order, 128 different families of spiders, over 4,000 different genera, and genera is the plural of the word genus, and over 48,000 described species. And I say as of yesterday, because there are new species of spiders being discovered everywhere on earth every single year. In fact, last year, uh, some colleagues and I published a paper on a new species of spider that represents a new family, my, my Marmico cultoridae. And these are tiny little spiders that live inside ant nests in the, in the deserts of Texas down through Mexico. And these little spiders are living in the, in the colonies in these underground ant nests where they are protected against their own predators by the host ants and they are experiencing very stable microclimatic conditions, stable temperature, stable humidity, and they have lots of food under there because they have food in the, in the form of other arthropods that are living inside these underground ant colonies. So it's a good deal if you can do it, and they have evolved adaptations that allow them to sneak in and live inside these colonies. So this is just an example of one species and one family. Species are being discovered every single year, everywhere on Earth that spiders are found. So let's, let's think about these numbers a little bit more, and let's sort of dissect them. And let's compare the number of spider species. So I said there are over 48,000 described species of spiders on Earth. And let's compare those numbers with some popular vertebrate groups, like, I don't know, birds and mammals. So worldwide, there are about 10,000 species of birds, and there are about, uh, about 6,000, a little bit over 6,000 species of mammals on Earth. Um, but of scientists who are studying these animals, there are only about 600 professional arachnologists on Earth to study not just the 48,000 described species of spiders, but the hundreds of other hundreds of thousands of other species of arachnids, scorpions, daddy long legs, mites, and ticks. So we have a lot of work cut out for us to understand the biology of this incredibly species-rich group of organisms. Whereas birders, there's too many ornithologists and birders to count, way more than 10,000. And there's way more than 6,000 different mammologists. In fact, just in the society, American Society of, of Mammalogy alone in this country, there are 2,500 members of that society. And that doesn't include all the societies worldwide that study mammals. So there's lots of scientists studying vertebrates, not so many studying arachnids or even other arthropods. Now, in the, in the early uh, 1900s, an arachnologist by the name of William S. Bristow estimated that a one-acre field could house upwards of a quarter million individual spiders. And late in the summer, early in the fall, oftentimes the baby spiders called spiderlings will hatch out of the egg sacs and will disperse by a process, a long distance dispersal process called ballooning, where they release the line of silk and go flying off into the air and land wherever. And you can see sites like, like you see in these two pictures where fields are absolutely carpeted with spider silk. So when you see a scene like this, it's not hard to imagine that there could in fact be a quarter million individual spiders in that field. There's a, an urban myth that says wherever you are, there is a spider within about 10 feet of you. That's true. That's absolutely true in my house because spiders get to live for free in my house. I don't kill them. I have a tarantula right 
next to me um, that I can show and tell later, later on in the Q&A. So, but even for you guys, there are spiders right outside your doors. There are spiders that come into your homes, nothing to worry about. And in fact, they're, they're keeping down the, the insect population in the house. So they're good, a good house guest to have. Now, when I tell most people what I study and that I'm an arachnologist and I'm a spider expert, you can imagine what their response is. The most common response is something like this. But hopefully by the end of the lecture, you will be convinced that this is not the rational response for I study spiders. In fact, ho hopefully I'll get you all to be interested in studying spiders that are outside your home. Because I think one of the reasons why some people are a little bit reluctant or hesitant about spiders is because they know they're predators, they know they have venom, and they're, they're worried about them. But in fact, of those 48,000 described species of spiders on Earth, very, very, very few species have venom that's of medical importance to humans. Now, that's not to say that there are very few that have venom. They're all essentially all venomous. There's one family that lacks venom glands. But essentially, all, all spider species have venom. They're all venomous. But they don't have venom that is harmful to humans for the most part. Why is that? Well, part of it is because we're big animals. They're little animals. So oftentimes, their jaws, called chelicerae, the chelicerae is the name of their jaws, are just too small to pierce our human skin. For the vast majority of spiders, the venom has evolved to immobilize and kill insects. Insects have a very different physiology than humans. And so there's nothing in the spider venom that is going to harm humans because it didn't evolve to respond to human physiology. It, was, it evolved to take down insects. So there's nothing in the venom that we respond to particularly badly. And spiders are active in very different times of day than humans are. Humans are diurnal for the most part, except maybe teenagers. But humans are mostly active during the day, and most spiders are active primarily at night. So we, we're, we're not, we don't correspond in terms of our life cycles, in terms of our activity patterns. So we're less likely to encounter spiders. And the vast majority of spiders, even black widows, are way too timid to bite and, and to harm humans. So even when you encounter them, they're much more likely to run away. Even when you, and they, they have to be seriously perturbed, seriously provoked for a spider to bite you. And even then, the, the venom that they produce is metabolically expensive. So oftentimes bites from spiders are completely asymptomatic because they don't want to waste that metabolically expensive venom just to get away from you. They're just giving you a nip to try to get away. So those are some of the reasons why the vast majority of spiders are not of any concern to humans. Now here in this region, the one species that we have that does have medically important venom for humans is the black widow spider, Latrodectus hesperus. We have one species of black widow that lives in the western states, the western black widow, and it has the, the classic bright uh, very shiny black abdomen, at least females do, with the red marking underneath, as you see in the slides. But keep in mind that the adult males, this is a picture of an adult male black widow, and adult males and juvenile black widows have very, very different dorsal or top markings on the body. So they still have the red marking on the underside, on the ventral surface or the belly side, but they have browns and yellows and, and red markings on the top. So they look really different. Uh, they all are venomous, males, females, juveniles, all have venom glands. You're less likely to be bitten by a, a, or to encounter a male than you are a female. Females stay put in their labs, males go wandering, they're much more active because they're not interested in prey, they're interested in finding a female. Um, but there's a myth that male black widows can't bite or don't bite or don't have venom, and that's, that's not true. They do have venom gland, but they're unlikely to be, you're unlikely to encounter a male. And even the black widow, um, if the black widow bites you, and it is unlikely to bite you. They're very timid spiders. They have extremely strong silken webs. So you can tell when you have a black widow web around your home because it'll be really messy. And if you pull your finger through the silk, it's like pulling through, through thin cotton threads. It's that strong. <clears throat> but if you do find a, a black widow it's, and, and bother it, it's going to run away from you. Bites occur when people accidentally press down 
on the spider. So for example, if a black widow is hiding underneath a rock or a log in your garden, you don't know it's there, you lift up the log, you're trapping the spider. And that's when bites typically occur, is when the spider is trapped. And even then, I had a black widow bite me during a program at the museum once. I was handling a black widow, which I like to do to show people that they're not gonna go for your jugular. And I was handling it and I'd been handling her all evening. When I put her back into her cage, she gave me a little nip on the finger. It was strong enough that I could feel the chelicery. I could feel her fangs, I could feel the nip, but there was no subsequent pain. So it was clear that it was a dry, pretty much a dry bite. My finger was a little bit tender for a couple of days, but no subsequent painful symptoms. So that was a good example of, a, of an asymptomatic bite by a black widow. Um, when black widows do bite, typically there's little pain right at the bite site, but what's happening dectin is a neurotoxin and it causes a sudden release of neurotransmitters throughout the body, acetylcholine and norepinephrine, and it causes severe painful symptoms throughout the body. Some of the typical symptoms of black widow envenomation, and they these, the painful symptoms occur within about a half an hour of being bitten. And the typical symptoms include a hardening or a, a pain in the stomach muscles and the abdominal muscles. It feels like somebody has been kicking you in the gut over and over and over again. Sweating, facial contortions, a hypertension or an increased heart rate, pain in the joints, pain in the lymph nodes, uh, some just general malaise. So those are some typical symptoms. Um, what's interesting about black widow bites is that they, they vary depending on the mammal. So humans, adult healthy humans won't die, although they, you might wish you were dead because it's that painful apparently. Rabbits seem to be resistant to the venom. They don't, they don't show any kind of symptoms. Rats, cats, guinea pigs, mice, and horses might die uh, when exposed to the venom or when bitten. Dogs might get sick. So it's, it's interesting that it varies depending on the mammal. The treatments are variable. Um, they're untreated. If you don't get any treatment, you have to put up with those painful symptoms, but they will resolve on their own within about two days, 48 hours. Uh, there is anti-venin available, and the way they get the anti-venin is they expose horses to a little tiny bit of that latrodectin, of, that, of the venom component, and the horse is a big animal, so it produces a lot of antibodies, and they can use that horse serum to then derive the anti-venin. But it turns out that horse serum has a protein in it that a very tiny percentage of the human population is allergic to. So oftentimes when, a, when a, an adult human, an adult person gets bitten by a black widow, doctors are a little bit reluctant to administer the anti-venin because there is a very slight risk of anaphylactic shock of, of this allergic reaction. Very unlikely, but it, it is there. And there was one reported case in the literature of someone dying from antivenin uh, from being exposed to this horse serum in the antivenin. And some physicians told me about another case that they were aware of, of someone having an allergic reaction to the antivenin. So there is some reluctance. And oftentimes in that case, the doctors will, will administer pain meds until the painful symptoms resolve themselves within a couple days. And I answer about 300 questions about spiders every single year, to pretty much a question a day, it averages out to. And yet I get very few questions about black widows. The only black widow questions I get here in Colorado, because everybody, they're very common. Everybody sees them. Everybody knows to be aware of them. They know if they're in your home, get them out of the house. Um, so people are, are already know about black widows. Uh, the only questions I get about black widows are from arachnophiles who, who want advice on how to keep their, black, their pet black widow happy. But the spider I get most of my questions about is something that does not even naturally occur in the state, which is the recluse spider. The brown recluse spider is in the family Sicariidae, and, and it's in the genus Loxosceles, which you see here. There are several different species in the United States of spiders in the genus Loxosceles. They're, they can all be called commonly recluse spiders. They're also called violin spiders because they have this stupid marking on their cephalothorax. And let me introduce you to spider morphology while we're here. So spiders have two body parts. They have the cephalothorax, which is the head region, and they have the abdomen. They have four, four pairs of legs, eight legs total, and they have a pair of front appendages called pedipalps which I'm gonna to refer to later in the talk. 
So these are called uh, fiddleback spiders or violin spiders because of this marking that looks like an upside down violin. But that's a really terrible way to identify reckless spiders from anybody else because to the arachnophobe, every spider out there looks like it has a violin marking on it. The real way to tell these spiders from anybody else is to look at the eyes because most spiders have eight eyes. These guys only have six eyes and their range is three pairs of eyes around the cephalothorax, two, two, and two. So when somebody calls me up and says, I, I think I have recluse spiders in my house, and I say, no, probably not, because they're not found here in Colorado, naturally occurring. And they say, oh, no, it has that fiddle marking. I say, well, that's not the way to tell. You look at the eyes, and, and they have these six eyes. And of course, their response is, what are you kidding? I'm not going to get that close. But that is the way to tell recluse spiders from other, from other spiders. And a colleague of mine, Greta Binford, who's, who's currently president of the American Arachnological Society, she does a lot of her research on the evolution of recluse spider venom and, and venoms in this family, Sicariidae. And uh, the reason that recluse spiders are notorious is because they have a component in the venom called sphingomyelinase D. And in our tissue cells, in the cell walls of our tissues is sphingomyelin. So when you get bitten by a, a brown recluse, first of all, most bites are asymptomatic, just like I, I mentioned before. But if they do envenomate you, that sphingomyelinase D in the venom will break down the tissue, the cell walls of the tissue right around the bite site. And it causes these nasty, open, necrotic lesions or wounds that take a long time to heal. There's no anti-venom available for recluse spiders. So the best that you can do is to debride, debride the, the wound, keep it clean, make sure that no secondary bacterial infection sets in, and it'll heal over time. It'll heal, it'll take a while to heal, but it will heal. In very extreme cases, it might require a skin graft if the wound becomes very craterous, but that, that's very rare. But there are a lot of medical conditions that can cause, or, or let me first say, this is the least likely cause for nasty necrotic wounds in the Western states because this is the distribution map of spiders, the recluse spiders. So these are different species of recluse spiders in this, in this shading. And you can see that none of the Western states are part of the natural range of any of the recluse spider species, any species of loxosceles. That doesn't say, that doesn't, I, I don't mean to say that they don't get into the state once in a while when somebody moves from an area of the country where they are found. But, and a, po a little population might get established. So we have historical records of populations from a warehouse in Denver, a house in Lamar, a house in Pueblo. But, I would put money on it that if you go back to those point localities where they were introduced, that population dies off after a year or two. And it does not spread past that point location because we just are in the wrong climatic conditions for the establishment of any of these species. We're too dry and not, we're not moist enough and we're too cold in the winter, kind of a combination of bad climatic conditions for them. And be aware that there are a lot of other medical conditions that have been, that can cause craters, nasty necrotic lesions that have been misdiagnosed as spider bites. One of the more common ones is probably MRSA, which is the methicillin resistant staph infection, the flesh eating bacteria. That is misdiagnosed as spider bites all the time. And it is a staph infection. So doctors should be able to culture the wound and determine that it is in fact a bacterial infection and not, a spider, not the result of a spider bite. Also lymphoma can cause these ulcerous wounds that have been misdiagnosed as spider bites. Lymphoma is a kind of cancer. How disastrous would that be if it was misdiagnosed as a spider bite and turned out to be cancer? Uh, diabetic ulcers have been misdiagnosed as spider bites. All these things in the table can cause these necrotic wounds and lesions and have been, mis excuse me, have been misdiagnosed as spider bites. So it is important to be aware that in this region of the country, the least likely cause for nasty open wounds are spiders. And some colleagues a few years ago wanted to ask the question, well, we know that climate is changing. So as climate changes, will we then see the ranges of recluse spiders extend into the Western states? And so they did all these different climate models uh, with different climatic, future climatic conditions, and in none of their models did the range of recluse spiders extend into the western states. So, whew, nothing to worry about there. So, 
we've talked about the, the dangerous spiders, and let's talk about why spiders have venom and how do they deliver venom to the prey. So they use fangs. Their chelicery, their jaws, are tipped by hollow fangs. And you're looking at the pictures, you're looking at the underside of the spider's cephalothorax. These are close-up views of these pointy fangs. These are the fangs of, uh, these are the fangs of uh, mygalomorph spiders, tarantulas. Tarantulas have fangs that are more or less parallel to one another and operate kind of like the, the tongs of a garden rake. Whereas araniomorphs, everybody else, all the other spiders, and all the spiders we're going to see here in the Denver area are araniomorphs, have fangs that move in opposition to one another. They move kind of like scissors. And that's what you see down here. So what the spiders do is when they're hunting insects, they will inject their, the venom with these pointy fangs, these hollow fangs. And the fangs have tubes that lead right inside their body to the venom glands. In mygalomorphs, the venom glands are in the chelicery. In araniomorphs, the venom glands are in the cephalothorax. So they can inject the venom using the, the fangs. And then what they do, they can't chew up their food. So once the prey has been immobilized, they will, out of their mouth, so we're looking at the underside of the cephalothorax in this view, and we're looking at the opening to the mouth. The opening to the mouth is surrounded by these three plates, the endites and the labium, which themselves are bordered by these hair-like seedy. And the hair-like seedy are acting as sieves or filters. What the spider then does once the prey is immobilized is it it squeezes its, its stomach, which is in the cephalothorax, is surrounded by muscles. And it squeezes those muscles of the, of the sucking stomach and regurgitates or vomits out digestive enzymes. The digestive enzymes get through the body of the insect prey, through the holes they've just poked using the fangs, and maybe through other openings that they've ripped into the chitin, the exoskeleton of the insect. The enzymes break down, pre-liquefy the tissue of the prey, and then they reverse the process. They relax the stomach muscles, and that creates a suction, and then they suck up all that nice pre-liquefied, pre-digested material. So feeding in spiders is a series of vomit and suck, vomit and suck, vomit and suck, until they've finally pre-digested and sucked up all that nice pre-digested meal. It's a very efficient way to eat because you don't have to waste any additional energy once those, those nutrients are in the body to break it down. It's already been pre-digested. The CD are filtering out any indigestible particulate bits like the chitin, the exoskeleton of the insects. Now, when most people think about spiders, they think about the Charlotte's Web spiders, the spiders that build these beautiful round orb webs. But in fact, there are a lot of spiders that do not use webs to catch prey. So for example, the megalomorphs, I just talked about megalomorphs with their fangs that move like this, the tarantula group. So tarantulas are non-web building. Uh, and what a lot of the tarantulas here in Colorado do, and we find tarantulas down in the, the big hairy tarantulas down in the southeastern part of Colorado, they will build silk lined underground burrows that have lines of silk that extend out of that burrow that act as trip lines. So this, the tarantulas will live inside those burrows and when an insect walks past the burrow, it vibrates those trip lines of silk. The spider inside can feel those vibrations and will rush out and grab the insect to drag it back into the burrow. So my galomorphs are a kind of non-web building hunter. This is a really cool spider. This, this, these are pictures I took in Trinidad and Tobago. And this is a mygalomorph called a trapdoor spider. And these very cool little tarantula-like things build silk-lined underground burrows. And they build a, a little wafer door. And they keep the door shut by pulling on it with their fangs. So they maintain pressure on that door and keep it shut. But outside of that burrow are silk lines, which you don't necessarily see in this photo, but they're acting like trip lines. And so if something moves outside that burrow, say, oh, I don't know, maybe the camel hair brush of an arachnologist, for example, 
uh, moves outside, the spider can feel those vibrations. And I tell you, these spiders will throw that door open and rush outside so fast that a particular female arachnologist screamed like a girl, threw her camel hair brush behind her, but she did manage to get this picture of the, of the owner of that burrow. So this is the trapdoor spider that built that burrow. And what's cool about this photo is, hopefully you can see my arrow and you can see this dimple in the top of the cephalothorax. That internally is the attachment point for the stomach muscle that I talked about. So I think that's kind of cool. Another kind of non-web building spider are wolf spiders in the family Lycosidae. And wolves in Colorado. And wolf spiders have a very distinctive pat eye pattern. So they have eight eyes like most spiders do. And we're looking right down on the cephalothorax in this bottom right photograph. So wolf spiders have a row of four small eyes right in the front of the cephalothorax and four very large eyes arranged like the corners of a square right on top of the cephalothorax. So that's how you can tell wolf spiders from other spiders is just by the eye pattern. The other cool thing about wolf spiders is when the females mate, and are ready to lay their eggs, they will lay their eggs in a silken egg sac. So they protect the eggs in this little ball of silk, this egg sac, silken egg sac, which most spiders do. But what the wolf spiders do is they attach that silken egg sac to the butt end, to the spinnerets, and they carry that silken egg sac around with them and protect it. When the babies hatch out of the eggs, the female can feel the movement of the babies inside the silken egg sac. She'll turn around, she'll chew a hole in the egg sac with her chelicerae, with her, with her jaws, and the babies all come out and they all hitch a ride on mama's back. So that's what you're seeing here. These are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little baby spiders that have just hatched and are hitching a ride on mama. And they will live off of leftover nutrients from the egg stage. When those nutrients have been depleted, the babies will all disperse. At that point, they're old enough to hunt for themselves. And at that point, they disperse pretty fast and pretty far because if they hang around too long, everybody is hungry, including mom. So they could be fodder for brother, sister, mom at that point. Um, I've had uh, occasions where I've had people call me up at the museum and tell me that, a big spider came into their house and they stepped on it and it exploded into hundreds of more spiders. And of course, what happened is they had a wolf spider come into their house that had babies on the back. They didn't notice the babies. When they stepped on the mom and killed her, all the babies dispersed. And so it wasn't exploding in, in spiders, but all the little babies were moving off of her. This is looking at the underground burrow of one of our larger species of wolf spiders that lives out on the great on the plains. So you can very clearly in this view see the silk line burrow and all the silk lines that are extending away from that turret that are acting like triggers, like trip, trip lines. Another kind of non-web building spider are, are fishing spiders in the family Pissoridae. And fishing spiders, they are pretty large spiders. They kind of superficially look like wolf spiders, but they hang out near water and they monitor the surface of the water with their front legs. And they're feeling for movement of, in, of aquatic insects or little fishes that are swimming just beneath them. When they feel those vibrations, they can dive down, grab the insect or the, or the fish, and drag it up to the surface to feed on it. Another kind of non-web building spider that's very common in Colorado are salticity, the jumping spiders. And jumping spiders, lots and lots and lots of species here in Colorado. This is one of the uh, groups that is active diurnally. It's an, a diurnally active spider, active during the daytime. So you're very likely to encounter jumping spiders. And jumping spiders have very distinctive eye pattern. They have two very large front eyes and the rest of the eyes are arranged like a U around the cephalothorax and they have extremely good vision. This is looking at the visual field in the bottom right uh, view is the visual field of a jumping spider. So they can see nearly 360 degrees around them so it's coming at them from any direction. They have extraordinarily good eyesight and they can see in color. And they oftentimes are very brightly marked, very color, colorful markings on the body, especially the males, because they use those colorful markings in courting the females. So they're very, very interesting courtship as well.
another kind of non-web building spider are crab spiders in the family Tomicidae. And crab spiders are called crab spiders because their legs are oriented side to side to, from the, the side of the body. Ladder grade is what we call it. They also have interesting eye pattern, a very distinctive eye pattern where the lateral eyes seen in the upper right here are, are out on tubercles. And they are sit and wait predators. Oftentimes, a lot of species of crab spiders are sitting and waiting for pollinators to come and visit flowers. So they sit and they wait very patiently on a flower. And when a pollinator comes, they will use the, these spiny front legs to grab that pollinating insect. And a lot of crab spiders are colored the same color as the background that they're sitting on. So they're camouflaged. In fact, in this photograph, this is a photo I pulled off the internet, but here are the legs of the crab spider. You can't, can hardly even see the crab spider and it's feeding on a fly that had visited this flower. In fact, there's a species of crab spider that can actually change its color. It can change from yellow to white or white to yellow, depending on the kind of flower that it's sitting on. It's not instantaneous, but it can shift those, um, the pigments in its body to match the flower color. Another kind of common non-web building spider that we have here in Colorado, this is a louse hunter in the family Desderity. We have one species in this family throughout, North, throughout the United States, Desdera crocata. And it's called a louse hunter because it, it comes from Europe where, and was introduced to the US and it spread throughout the United States. And in Europe, they call the, the, the primary prey of this spider which we call roly polies or pill bugs. In Europe, they call pill bugs or roly polies, they call them wood lice, hence the louse hunter. And they have very long chelicerae and very long fangs that are specialized to snap around the round body of the pill bug and feed on it. One of the cool things about this photograph, I'm pointing to the spider's heart, which you can see this shadowy image is the heart of the spider that you can see through the, the thinner exoskeleton of the abdomen. I think that's kind of cool. Another very cool uh, non-web building spider, we do not have this here in Colorado or in the Western states, but you'll find these spiders in the Northeast and in, the, in tropical regions. These are spitting spiders in the family Skytodidae. And spitting spiders are characterized by having a very domed, very high cephalothorax. You can see that here. This is a picture I took down in Mexico of a, of a spitting spider there. And if we look inside the cephalothorax, it has a huge uh, glue gland that is kind of hooked up to the venom gland. And this glue gland, the, the, these spiders have tiny little fangs. When they see an insect walking in front of them, they will stick those itty bitty fangs straight up and they will spit glue at the prey and glue it down onto the substrate. That's what you see here is these lines of glue. Then they will come up to the prey that's been glued down onto the substrate under the surface and then they'll envenomate it. Even amongst the web building spiders, the kind of web that you see is characteristic of different kinds of spiders. So if you see a Charlotte's web out there, an orb web, a round beautiful web that we think about when we think about spiders, that is a web that's built by orb weave, an orb weaving spider in the family Araneidae. If you see a web like this, where you have a, a sheet of silk, a platform of silk and a funnel retreat where the spider hides, that's built by funnel web spiders in the family Agilinity. And the spider hangs out in the funnel. And then when an insect blunders onto the surface of the web, it rushes out of the funnel, grabs the insect and drags it back into the funnel. This is a Boland doily or grass spider in the family Linophiidae. This is a huge family. This family Linophiids, this, this Linophiidae includes probably about 3,000 species. This is a really large family. Maybe not that many, but it's lots and lots of species in the family Linophiidae. When they, they can, and they're small spiders. Linophiids usually don't get more than four millimeters, which is less than a quarter of an inch. Most of them are about one or two millimeters in size. If you go out in your yard early in the morning and look in the divots in your grass and you see a little quarter size silken web, that's being built by a member of this family, Linophiidae. But they also, there are members that also build three-dimensional webs in bushes. 
um, that are called bowl and doily webs. And the spider hangs out underneath the bowl part of, part of the web, but it can feel the vibrations of insects from any direction and hunt that insect. This is a, a spider called the triangle web weaver in the family Euliboridae. And these are found in very isolated pockets in Colorado in some conifer forests. They're not very common, but they build this triangle shaped web and they monitor that web with a single line of silk, which you see in the, in the left hand uh, photograph. That little white dot, that's the spider. This is a close up view of the spider. And the spider maintains tension on that web by pulling on that single line of silk keeping the web taut. When an insect flies into the surface of that web, it releases that tension and that causes the insect to get all caught up in the silk. This is another spider. This is not found here in Colorado, but it's, uh, you can find this down in the southeastern states, like in Florida, Louisiana, you'll see ogre face spiders in the family Dinopidae. And the common name comes from their face. They have a face only a mother can love. They have these giant eyes. They build these postage stamp sized web the square web that they hold onto with their first pair of legs and they hang upside down in the vegetation as you see here and they hold that web down below them they're watching for insects walking beneath and when they see an insect walking past them they push that web right into the insect and tangle it up kind of the inverse of fishing now, regardless of what kind of spider we're talking about, whether it's a tarantula, whether it's a web builder, a non-web builder, one of the things they all have in common, every single one of them, is they all produce silk. The silk is produced in silk glands in the abdomen. Spiders have seven different kinds of silk glands that produce seven different kinds of proteinaceous silk, protein-derived silk slightly different in, in molecular composition. And the silk emerges from the abdomen through these structures called spinnerets. So we're looking at the very butt end of the spider here. And on the surface of the spinnerets, you see these tiny little silk spigots. That's where the silk is being squeezed out of. So let's take a look at the inside of the spider. And here we can see these silk glands. And some of these glands produce silk that is used for covering the eggs, for making the egg sacs. Some of the silk is used for making drag line. As the spider is moving through the environment, it's continually laying a line of silk. Some of the silk is used for the prey capture silk of an orb web. Some of it is used for the, the structural support lines of webs. Some of it is used for different kinds of silk are used for the lining the underground burrows. So seven different glands, seven different kinds of proteinaceous silk. And the silk is stored in these silk glands and produced in liquid form. But as it is squeezed out of these glands, through these tubes, and finally out of the abdomen through these little tiny spigots, a lot of the moisture, a lot of the water molecules are reabsorbed by the spider's body. But the silk is still, when it emerges, it's still in liquid form. It's still a droplet of silk. It changes its composition from liquid to solids, its molecular structure from liquid to solid, when the spider puts it under some tension. And that can happen when the spider pulls it out of its abdomen, like you see here, or it can happen when the spider attaches the droplet to a structure, like a twig, and then moves away. That's enough tension to change that matrix, the protein matrix from liquid to solid, or it can happen when the droplet gets picked up by a breeze and is pulled away from the spider's body. That's enough tension to change it from liquid to solid. The extraordinary thing about some of the silk that the spider can make is that spider silk has extraordinary properties. By, it is stronger by unit weight than steel, and it is extraordinarily elastic. So spider silk is kind of the holy grail of material science. Material scientists want to figure out how to mass manufacture a, a a something that is identical in composition and in these features as spider silk. It is as strong and as elastic, but they haven't been able to do it yet. Yet there are a lot of scientists out there who are researching, doing research on spider silk, trying to figure out how to find a way to mass manufacture something that has these same properties. 
one story I like to tell about a group of scientists and the crazy thing that they did is there were some scientists in Madagascar and in Madagascar, there was a, there's a population of these very, very large spiders. These, these spiders are called golden orb spiders. They're in the genus Nephila. Uh, they used to be in, they're in different families. Let's just say that. The family uh, uh, position of these spiders changes seems like from year to year, but they're called golden uh, orb spiders, golden web spiders, because they're, they're webbing, their silk is literally golden, it's, it's yellow. And these spiders in Madagascar are about almost a third the size of my face. So they are probably in length about three inches. So they're producing a lot of silk. There was a healthy population of these Nephilim spiders in this one locality in Madagascar. So with this group of, I don't know if they were researchers or just crazy people, but what they did is they, they created this little apparatus where they could go into the, into the forest, collect a Nephilim spider, bring it in, attach it to this apparatus gently, and then they milked, they pulled silk out of the abdomen of these spiders and spooled it. And, and when the spider got tired uh, and stopped producing the silk, they gave it a little droplet of water, gave it a drink, let it go outside, got another spider in, did the same thing, and just kept spooling and spooling and spooling and milking the silk out of these spiders until they had enough to make this. So they made this beautiful, incredible cape entirely out of the silk of these Nephilim spiders. And this cape, look at the designs that they, that, that they included in the cape. They wove into it in homage to the spider as the, the Nephilim spider itself. It took the silk from 1.2 million spiders. It took eight years to make. One ounce of silk was the silk milk from 23,000 spiders. Extraordinary. So I'm going to end this lecture with a little um, sex talk. So we're going to talk about how spiders make more spiders. Uh, and let me first remind you about spider anatomy. So spiders have two body parts, cephalothorax abdomen. They have four pairs of legs. I already talked about that. And they have these front pair of appendages. In female spiders, these front appendages called pedipalps are very delicate looking, they're very leg-like. But in male spiders, adult male spiders look like they're wearing boxing gloves. And the adult male spiders are using these pedipalps, these boxing glove-like pedipalps to inseminate the females. So when a male spider matures into adulthood, his testes are fully developed. The testes are in the abdomen. And what he does is he builds a little postage stamp size web, oh, sorry, not postage stamp, a little silken web, tiny little web, sometimes just a little silk line called a sperm web. And onto that sperm web through his abdomen, through an opening in his abdomen, he deposits a droplet of sperm. Then he uses these specialized tubes uh, that are associated with his pedipalps and sucks that sperm droplet into his pedipalps. Then he has to find a female. And if this is looking at the male, the pedipalp of an adult male and his corresponding consort, the female. So the female has structures surrounding her genital opening on her abdomen that correspond to structures on the male pedipalp. So he will, when he encounters her, he will lock his pedipalp in place. And then he will unwind that tube and inseminate her with a sperm. So that's how, how mating occurs. The trick is that it's very dangerous. Mating in spiders is very dangerous because in the world of spiders, oftentimes there is a, a dimorphism. There's a difference in size between males and females. And when there's a difference in size, it is almost always in favor of the female. The female is almost always larger than the male, sometimes considerably larger. So, so this is one of these Nephila spiders. That's the adult female. That little tiny thing, that's, that's her male. That's the male. Um, and I think this is why there's so many female arachnologists, because we have a we have a hold on on the males in the world of spiders. But that's just that's just an idea. Anyway, when the male 
web building spider encounters a female on her web, he will sing a silk song to her. He will pluck her web in a species specific way that communicates that he's a mate, not a meal, and is she interested? If she's interested, she will respond with vibrational cues accordingly. Then he will slowly approach her. He might contact her, and if she's still receptive, then he will mate with her by inserting the, that tube associated with his pedipalp. And if it's a, a non-web building spider, the male will dance for his lady love, or he might tap a signal outside of her burrow. So for tarantulas, the males knock outside in a species-specific way. And the female can, can hear, the, hear those vibrations. Male jumping spiders, wolf spiders will oftentimes dance for their lady love. So they wave their pedipalps in a species-specific way. They might do a zigzag dance. And if she's receptive and it's the right species, then she will respond accordingly and then he can approach her and mate with her. Very dangerous though, to be a male spider. So I'm gonna leave you with this last little story, which is of little Miss Muffet, who sat in her tuffet, ran away when she saw a spider. Well, it turns out that little Miss Muffet was a real child whose father was an actual physician named Thomas Muffet, who actually did use spiders in some of his remedies. So if somebody came to Dr. Muffet with a fever or malaria, he might recommend that they swallow a spider and a bit of butter. Asthma, eh, swallow some spider salt, that'll take care of it. If they're bleeding or have a cut, he might recommend that they wrap the wound in spider salt. That one is probably efficacious because we know now that spider silk is incredibly strong and it turns out that it has properties that prevent molds and fungi and bacteria from landing on and growing on the silk. So it is a pretty good sterile bandage. So with that, I'm gonna end the lecture and I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna open the, uh, the forum for questions. Thank you so much, Paula. That was really wonderful. Um, I am always in awe of how much I managed to learn uh, during these presentations. Ooh, top of my head's cut off. Let me scoot back a little bit. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the program, I was never super into spiders. You know, I always sort of respected their distance, um, but never really admired them. And then every time I've gotten to talk with you, I've just gained a new, uh, new respect for them. And currently, what my mind is blown on is the idea that they're plucking webs and playing songs and doing dance. Uh, it's, spiders don't have Tinder, so uh, they, have <laughs> they, to do what they, have to. <laughs> they do what they have to do to make sure that they can get their their mates. Um, so that was fabulous. Uh, yeah. We at this time folks are ready to take some questions. We did already see some come in in the chat. So I think I'll start with some of those, but do keep those questions coming. Um, I am going to start off with one question that immediately blew my mind. Uh, why is it that black widow bites might be poisonous or not poisonous, venomous, excuse me, wow. Uh, I should know by now the difference between poison and venom, actually, especially after so many lectures with you. Why is it that a horse might die from I, I don't know. That's an interesting question, and I don't actually know the answer to that. I don't know why there's this difference in susceptibility to the venom depending on the mammal, but I, I find that really fascinating, and I, I think it just depends on the difference in physiology of these different mammals. Very good. Um, real quick, Karen just asked us to clarify, what is the difference between poison and venom? I very quickly was like, oh gosh, I got it wrong. So do you know the uh, difference? Uh, 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 so venom, is, I'm going to get it wrong too, but uh, poison is, is something manufactured in, I don't know, and Here. venom, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to define. Here's Look my definition. <laughs> Remember, we have this silly definition. We did, and I, I was going to leave it to you to defend it, you, or to define it. I promise I know what I'm talking about, folks. Uh, poison is something that is absorbed. So um, like mushrooms, for example, are poisonous and dart frogs, for example, are poisonous because uh, they sit on your skin and you absorb the toxins through your skin. Venom is injected. So through things like uh, fangs or stingers or um, cnidarians, so like corals and um, jellyfish and things like that, they have those barbs that inject. Uh, so what I always like to say is that if you bite it and you die, it's poisonous. If it bites you and you die, it's venomous. So there that's how I uh, that's how I keep it in mind. Yeah, Challen, I see that you have uh, got some comments in the chat saying the very same and thing. And there were some questions that came up about how there are still volunteer opportunities. You have to take my uh, my spy, either my spider biology course, which I teach at the museum occasionally, or I teach a free Colorado spider survey workshop. If you're interested in being a volunteer in arachnology, which is 
kind of off the table until the pandemic ends. But if you're interested, shoot me an email. I will add your email to my arachnophile list and you'll get notification about upcoming opportunities for training. And those are kind of pre pre uh, uh, prerequisites for become, being pulled into the museum as a volunteer. Uh, there was another question. Um, Oh, about spiders, whether they drink water, they do. Spiders are water, um, they do need a source of water. So most spiders, I think that some spiders like black widows, I think are quite good at getting the moisture directly from the prey. And that might be why black widows are so common in xeric environments like we live in. But for the most part, spiders do need an open source of water, which is why you find them. Where do you most likely find them in your house? You find them in your bathroom, in your tub, in your sink. And they're not coming up through the drain. They are seeking that source of, of moisture. They're following that, that humidity trail in your house. And they're ending up going into these smooth surfaced tubs or sinks. And then they can't get out. But they just want to drink. So just give them a drop of water and, and that'll, that'll, that'll help. Then you can take good. them outside. That was a pretty common question. I do see one, and I want to know the answer to this one too. So selfishly, I'm going to ask this one. Um, multiple people asked, how do we know that those jumping spiders see in color? You mentioned something about that. How do we know? Yeah, some colleagues uh, in Ohio did some really cool experiments where it turns out that, that jumping spiders respond to little tiny TV images of each other as if they're looking at another spider. And so they, the scientists suspected that they were using color cues during courtship. And so they were able, because the spiders were seeing the images on this little TV as, and responding to it as another spider, they were able to alter the color, um, the color cues of that image and see how it changed the behavior of the spider. So they were able to determine that it does see in different kinds of color. That's really interesting. Um... Dang, that's cool. I don't know, just all these little things that we keep learning about these tiny little creatures um, that we find so often in our sinks and basements. Um, Somebody, I, it, earlier in the chat, they asked about spiders after the asteroid, and that was a good question. Uh, and I think they were talking about the asteroid that destroyed a lot of life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. But a lot of arthropods made it through that, um, that mass extinction. So they were not much affected. Uh, you did see a shift after, before and after the asteroid in some of the lineages of spiders. So even the spiders, it did affect some of them, but as a whole of that whole class of arachnids, they did make it through that mass extinction. Lucky them, or maybe not. Maybe that wasn't a very good day to be a spider. <laughs> um, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, and I know, Paula, you have a special guest with you. And I've seen several uh, chats coming in saying, can we see her? Can we see her? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll pull my tarantula out. And while I'm pulling her out, I'll also answer a few more questions that I saw in the chat, which is, uh, uh, there was one question about exterminators. You know, so How do you keep exterminators from killing the the spiders in your home. And you know, what I would recommend is um, if you're an arachnophobe and you're afraid of spiders, then sticky traps are actually pretty good at, at trapping the spiders and they're better than exposing yourself to those toxic poisons that exterminators use. You know, if you have a bed bug or a really bad infestation of some kind of pest, there's not much else you could do. You're just gonna have to, you know, go to, the, go to Orkin or, or the, um, exterminator and, and try to deal with that problem. But I wouldn't recommend exterminators except in extreme conditions. It's certainly not worth it to try to kill the spiders in your home and, and you're just exposing yourself to those, those chemicals and that's not a healthy thing. Um, somebody else asked about spiders uh, used as medicine. And uh, there are some parts of the world that eat spiders. They will roast, yeah, she's, this is blushful. So here she is. Um, some parts of the world will, will roast tarantulas. They burn off the hairs on the, on the abdomen because those can be irritating to your throat. Uh, but they apparently taste, I haven't eaten a tarantula, I've eaten other arthropods, but they apparently taste kind of nutty. Uh, but they're very popular in some parts of Asia. But in terms of medicine, uh, I think that they, there's a lot of research being done on, on spider venoms and how 
They can use venoms to control insects as pesticides. Um, and there's probably a lot of research being done in the venom world about how they can use different components of the venom for different medical uses. Talia, did you see other questions that I might be able to answer? Kind of oh, quick? we have so many. Um, I don't think we'll be able to answer them all tonight, folks. Um, and before I give Paula one last one and we say goodbye, um, we do have several, we've done several talks in the last several months with Paula um, that have been featured on our Facebook page and you do not need a Facebook account to watch them. So if you visit our Facebook page, just search Denver Museum of Nature and Science, or I think it's facebook.com slash DMNS org. Uh, I think if you look there, you should be able to find some of the videos, including like a spider, ask me anything. So uh, if some of your questions didn't get answered, check out those videos um, and you may find some answers there. Is, it, is um, it okay to keep going and I can answer a few more questions? Or is that- Sure. Uh, uh, I, we have just a couple minutes left and I don't want to go too far over time just because I know we have folks- So I can answer a lot of them really fast. I know. Okay. okay. Rapid <laughs> fire, Paula. I'll let you pull right. them and answer. The rapid them. fire biggest spider is Theraphosa blondi. Um, um, and it's about so big. You can see one over at the Butterfly Pavilion. So they have a biggest spider in the world. Uh, there are fossil spiders. There's a lot of uh, sp fossil spiders in the amber record, particularly, but they are soft bodied. So they don't fossilize in shale or those kinds of, of imprint uh, fossils very well. But you do see them occasionally, particularly like Fluorescent Fossil Bed is a really good one. Uh, recommendations for spider books. There's a book, a fantastic book field guide by Richard Bradley called Common Spiders of North America. I think it's 25 bucks or so, 35 bucks. Fantastic, beautiful illustrations. If you want a more technical ID guide, Spiders, uh, uh, Spiders of North America and Identification Guide edited by Daryl Ubik, uh, Pierre Paquin, and Paula Cushing is another one that's a really good one. Um, and I think that might be uh, the, oh, and the string of seven bites on one leg is probably caused by somebody else, probably not arachnids. In fact, multiple bites like that is almost certainly indication that it was a mosquito or a flea or a bed bug, sorry to say, but spiders are just biting to get away. So you don't, you're not gonna see those multiple bites. And whew, I think I've answered a few of them. So if I you have you others, did. feel free to email me. I think we may need to leave it there, but yeah, you're welcome to email Paula and do check back on our Facebook. Uh, one last quick question before we say goodbye. Uh, we did see a lot of questions tonight about how do you become an arachnologist? So what advice would you have for someone who's interested whether in becoming an arachnologist or just learning more about arachnids? It, you know, it, it, you can be an arachnologist at any age, uh, but if you want to make a career of it, um, you can even do that uh, even, even without you know, going to college and taking entomology cl classes and things like that. You can take a class from me. You can become involved in the lab and that's a good way. Some of my volunteers have done research in my lab and have even published papers. So that's a way that you can get involved in the field. There's lots of different venues and ways into the field of arachnology. I would recommend that you join some of the societies. American Arachnological Society is a really good one and very, very, very super supportive of students, uh, students, paraprofessionals, amateurs, and enthusiasts. So that, that's a really great way. And I think there's a local Facebook uh, group um, on arachnids. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but, but kind of look around on Facebook and you might find a group of other enthusiasts. So those are some different ways that you can get involved. Very good. All right. With that, I think it is time for us to say goodbye. Make sure you tune in to next week's presentation. I believe we are taking a virtual field trip to Colorado's next state park, Fisher's Peak. So uh, check out our website for more information. We'll be here at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, as per usual, for more science. So thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. We appreciate you being here. And remember, there are no brown recluse spiders in Colorado. If you take one thing away tonight, let it be that. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you being here. Um, Barb, I see your question about will this be available later? Yes, there will be a recording up on YouTube uh, sometime in the next week or so. So uh, glad that you're interested in watching back and taking more of a look at this. Thanks, everybody. We're going to go ahead and sign off now. Stay curious. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.